100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. He, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you today, we welcome your Holy Spirit among us and celebrate the gift of life that you have given each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice and open our hearts to receive your word in song, in prayer, and in your message today from Pastor Andrea. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen.
good. Even in the bad times, he's been faithful. Church, his goodness is coming after us. It's going to overtake us.
Laodicea was one of the richest commercial cities in the world. It was known for its banking system, wool production, manufacturing of clothing and carpet. It even had its own medical school. And no doubt it was an attractive city to live if you wanted to live in a city. There was a lot going on in Laodicea. And the church in Laodicea existed in this affluent environment which caused them to focus on acquiring material wealth and greater accomplishments. The church looked really good externally, but the church had problems. The problem is this. In verse 15 and 16, God says, I know your works. I know your deeds. I know that you're neither hot nor cold, and I wish that you were one or the other, but instead you are lukewarm, and I literally want to vomit you out of my mouth. This is a hard word this morning. I know you probably all wish I would have preached the other sermon I got, but this is the one I gave me. See, Jesus uses imagery to sum up his rebuke and accusation against the church of Laodicea. He condemns them for being neither cold nor hot, but he condemns them for being lukewarm. When Jesus says this, the members of the church would immediately understand what he was talking about. See, because while the city was rich, it did not have its own internal water supply. So they had to pipe water through underground aqueducts. From Hierapolis, which was seven miles away, they had hot springs, and it was used for healing. Colosse, which was six miles away, had a cold refreshing stream of, stream of water supply. You see, and by the time the water went through these underground ducts and reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm and repulsive. It could cause a person to be nauseous, sick to their stomach, and vomit. Jesus used cold, hot, and lukewarm water to describe three types of people. Jesus says, those that are lukewarm, I will vomit out of my mouth. Jesus was saying that the church in Laodicea was full of lukewarm Christians, and it was literally making him sick. You see, in the church of Laodicea, had almost totally accommodated the perspectives and values of the culture. The norms of the culture had become the standard by which they evaluated themselves. The norms of the culture had literally taken over the church. You see, this church fit comfortably and smoothly into the ebbs and flows of the world around them. They compromised the word of God. They left their first love, Jesus. As a matter of fact, Christ wasn't even in the church. And because of this, the church no longer had a purpose. Jesus is saying, Laodicea, I could actually take it. You better if you were hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, you're making me sick. Jesus has nothing good to say about this church in Laodicea. East Preston, we really need to ask ourselves this honest question. What is Jesus' observation of this church? What is his observation of you as a child of God? Are you hot? Are you cold? Or are you lukewarm? Are you passionate for God? Or have you lost your passion? Thinking that we're spiritual just because we come to church. Jesus makes it clear. We must choose either we are going to be hot, cold, or lukewarm. In verse 17, he's saying that we have become people who are too busy acquiring material wealth and material things. We act like everything that we have acquired was because of our own ability. I got this job because I went to school one day and got myself an education. I got this job because of my abilities, my talents. You see, we credit our accomplishments to our own ability, and therefore we have the mindset that we don't need God. I did this thing on my own and give God no credit. Yeah, you got a nice car. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you got a big house. You got money in the bank. You have all the things that make you successful, but you're literally making God sick. I know this is a hard word this morning. I didn't even want to preach it. I ain't gonna lie. Jesus tells them that even though you think you are rich, you are not. 
You're busy laying up treasures for yourself here on earth instead of laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. You don't realize just how wretched you are. You don't realize just how miserable you are, how poor you are, how blind and naked you really are. You regard Jesus less than you regard men. Jesus, the one who went to the cross, the one who bled, suffered, and died for you, the one who bore your sins on the cross. Jesus, the one who bore the 49 stripes on his back. Jesus, the one who laid down his life so that you might have life. You have come to the place that you regard him less than you regard man. Jesus is saying, you are a people who take more pride in the things of the world than you do the things of God. spiritual wealth. When are you going to get on fire for the kingdom of God? Church, Jesus wants us to invest more time and resources in developing our inward walk with him. But we're too busy trying to impress people that can't even get you into heaven. Unfortunately, the Laodiceans' material wealth came to them was more came to be more important to them than God. They depended on themselves rather than dependent on God. Church, Jesus was trying to convey to them and to us that our dependence is not on ourselves, but it is on the Lord. When we depend on ourselves, he's saying that it makes God sick. God wants us to recognize and realize our dependence needs, we need to depend on him. We need to trust him in every aspect of our lives. We need to trust him with our children. We need to trust him with our finances. Trust him with our marriage, our health. We need to trust him to build that new church. We need to trust him to open and close doors. We need to trust the Lord. And Jesus, because of his love for us, even though we are lukewarm, well, they're lukewarm, he tells us that all is not lost we can recover from this. Church God has no time for lukewarm Christians. They make him sick to the point that he wants to vomit them out of his mouth. But I'm here to tell you that the word of God says this, it's time to recover. It's time to get on fire. It's time to get back your passion for serving God. It's time to stop being lukewarm and just coming to church. It's time to reignite the fire for God. Church, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we as the church? What are you as individuals going to do in order to grow spiritually and be on fire for God? What you going to do to stay on fire for God? Jesus is telling them and he is telling us that we need to be spiritually wealthy, not earthly wealthy. Church, when was the last time that you assessed whether or not you were on fire for God? When was the last time? I'm here to tell you we are in the last days and Jesus is coming back soon. I'm here to tell you that Satan knows it. That's why he's busy using every ploy that he can to distract us from the things of God by using the things of the world. And I'm here to tell you if we continue to dapple, if we continue to participate, if we continue to practice the things of the world, we are making God sick to the point that he wants to vomit us out of his mouth. I don't know about you this morning, but the text in Matthew 7, 21 to 23 scares me. When it says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Lord, I even cast out demons in your name. Lord, I came to church every Sunday. Lord, I sang in the choir. Lord, I preached the word. Lord, I was a deacon. Lord, I was on the worship team and he says and then I will declare to them I never knew you. Depart from me you who practice lawlessness. Depart from me you who defy me. You who go against my word. You who defy my ways. You who are lukewarm. God is looking for a church of Christian folk who will truly be on fire for him. Not lukewarm believers who make him sick. 
You see, there are some Christians who think they are on fire for God, but really they're just actually lukewarm. What does it mean to be hot and on fire for God? You see, so in order to understand what it means to be on fire, we first need to understand what the word fire means. What is fire? How do you start a fire? How do you keep a fire going? What causes fire to go out? You see, in the natural, fire is a chemical process that requires three things. It requires oxygen, it requires heat, and it requires fuel. It is when these three things come together that we get fire. And if one of them is missing, then there is no fire. And so in order to get my point across this morning about being on fire for God, let's look at the process of firing up an old wood stove. Hello, somebody. Anybody remember back in the day when you had to light that wood stove to keep the house warm? How many remember how cold it was in the house when the fire went out? I'm here to tell you it's cold in the house when the fire goes out. And that's exactly how it is in God's house. It's cold when there's no fire. I'm so thankful today for hot air for and electricity, oh my goodness, yes I am, electric eaters, hot eaters. But back in the day, you would have to put so many blankets on you to keep warm that you couldn't even move because you had that many blankets on you. Well, I remember my mother saying to me, Andrea, it's time to fire up that stove. I was the eldest. Everybody else stayed with me and I went out in the cold and light the fire. There's a problem being the eldest. So the first thing I did was I had to get my fuel which was my paper and some, you know, thin kindling wood, you know? And then you start by, you know how you paste the paper on the bottom, right? Then you put some thin kindling wood on top of that, right? And then you gotta get your heat, which is that match. You gotta light the fire, see? So, and if you didn't have a match, you took some tall tissue and stuck it in the toaster. <laughs> you all know it's true. and it can choke you and take you out. You see, there are many people in the church today who are lukewarm and the only thing they're producing is smoke. Hello, somebody. How do you know that smoking is bad for you and it can kill you? I hope you all get convicted if you're smoking. Smoke is bad for you and it can kill you. Well, it's, I can say that because I used to be a smoker. Now, I'm just going to tell you straight up. We, if you're a smoker, you need to be delivered because it's bad for you. This here is your, I don't even know my script. This here is your Okay? What you put in it matters. Okay? God is calling us to go higher. You need to ask God to deliver you and set you free. That is a line right from the pit of hell. God did not call us to put a cigarette in our mouth and poison our own body. And then when we get cancer, we want everybody to pray for us. Put down the cigarette! We ought to go around and stop beeping. Danger! Danger the host! Smoky Christian in the back! Smoky Christian to the left! That's what we ought to do. But I said it takes three things to make a fire. Fuel, heat, and oxygen. And after you light the paper on fire, the next thing you do, what do you start doing? Church. You can draw somebody else to 
the fire. When there's fire in the church, you ought to set other people on fire. Oh, come on, somebody. When there's fire in the church, we can burn up some things that are not of God. When there's fire in the church, it'll burn up some shackles. It'll burn up some bondages of shame and rejection. When there's fire in the church, the Holy Ghost will come down. When there's fire in the church, lives will be transformed. When there's fire in the church, somebody will get healed. Somebody will get set free. I want to know, does anybody want fire in the church? I want some Holy Ghost fire up in here. Yes, I do. We need fire in the church. However, in order to keep the fire going, you have got to make sure that the vent is open and that there's a constant supply of oxygen. And you must keep adding fuel to the fire. Because if you don't continuously provide oxygen and add fuel to the fire, guess what happens, church? The fire goes up. See, in the natural, it takes fuel, heat, and oxygen. But in the spirit realm, it takes the Holy Spirit. That's your oxygen. It takes the word and prayer. That's your fuel. It takes some heat, which is the love that you have for God and the love that you have for others. See, oxygen in the spiritual is your constant supply of the Holy Spirit. And before Jesus ascended to the Father after his resurrection, he breathed on his disciples. And what did he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. For it is the Holy Spirit that reveals truth to the believer. It is the Holy Spirit that reveals to Christians the inner deep things of God. It is the Holy Spirit which enables us to interpret and understand the word of God. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin and wrongdoings in our lives in order to keep us in right relationship with God. East Preston, I want us to be a church that is hot. I want us to be a church that is on fire for God. But the truth of the matter is, too many churches, too many Christians have lost their fire. And they have become lukewarm. And they're making God sick. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, study the word, pray daily, truly love God and others, we will be a people in a church who are hot and on fire for God. You need fuel, BC, because it's imperative for the growth of every believer to spend time in prayer, spend time reading the Bible. God provided all the tools necessary to live a Christian life and to learn about him. It is now our responsibility as individuals to utilize the tools God gave us. Going to church and listening to a sermon is a wonderful addition to a life that is filled with the personal Bible study, with a life that is filled with prayer time. It's charming to church should never be your only source for a believer's spiritual growth. If you think coming to church is going to help you to grow, it's not going to do it. You need to be in your word daily. You need to come to Bible study. You need to hang out with other people who've got word up in them. And just as a person's body will die without proper nourishment, so will a spiritual life without the nourishment that God provides through the Bible, through quiet times with Him. I mean, we can see all kinds of examples in the scriptures where Jesus lived this truth by making prayer a priority in His own life. In Mark 12 and 20, says, and then He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And the second commandment is this love others love your neighbor as yourself these are the two greatest commandments when those of us who call ourselves christians who are on fire for god get filled with the holy spirit pray and study the word daily have a love for god and others then we will be a people we will be a church on fire see god wants a church that is hot and on fire for the kingdom. He doesn't want to be sick around us. Oh, no, no, he doesn't want to really vomit us out. Church, we gotta stop making him sick. Because in verse 18, Jesus says, I'm gonna give you the remedy to this lukewarm condition that you have. You don't have to stay lukewarm, he said. I got the answer for you. Number one, in verse he says, buy from me gold, refined by fire, so that you may be rich. Number two, he said, buy from me white garments, that you may clothe yourself, and that cover up your shame and nakedness. Then he said, three, buy from me eyes to 
anoint your eyes so that you can see. You see, in the Bible, refined gold represents faith. They thought their physical gold was their best currency. But Jesus gives them the truth that the best gold you can have, church, is your faith. You see, in order to reach your full potential for the kingdom of God, church, we need faith. I can testify to you that you better not put your faith in your job. You better not put your faith in material things. I can testify to you this morning because if you do, I had the experience. I lost my job and I lost all of my material things. But I'm here to tell you, and when you do, you're going to have to have faith in order to see through the loss. You got to have genuine faith. Jesus wants to seek, wants us to seek His true riches, because Matthew six and thirty says, three says, "What? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things that you desire will be given unto you." We are too busy desiring the gifts rather than the giver. That's the problem we have. And Jesus says, "If you desire Me, the one who gives the gifts, guess what? I'll give you the gifts that you desire." Colossians 2 and 3 tells us that true riches come from having the knowledge of Christ. Secondly, he tells us, he said, clothe yourselves with white garments. What he means by that is clothe yourself with purity. Clothe yourself with holiness and righteousness and refuse to participate in the idolatrous facet of this culture in the society in which we live. Church as Christians, we must ask ourselves the question, do we get more excited about the things of the world than we do the things of God? Do we get more excited about the events that take place in the world than we do about the events that take place in the church? Are our lives completely surrendered to God or are we lukewarm? with one foot in and one foot out, doing the hokey pokey and dancing all about, we're lukewarm. Jesus is saying that until we live a life that is completely sacrificed to God, we will make him sin. See, the Laodiceans took great pride in the fact that they developed an eye sock to heal eye problems. But Jesus is like this, yeah, yeah, you developed an eye sock to heal eye problems. But you yourselves are spiritually blind. Church, in the same way Jesus gave physical sight to the blind, we need him to give us spiritual sight. So that we can clearly see the danger that our association with this idolatrous world poses to our faith. We need spiritual eyesight, church, so that we can clearly see the truths of God's word and the lies of this world. See, the Laodiceans' illness of being lukewarm could only be remedied by a renewed relationship with Jesus Christ, by buying his true spiritual resources of faith, purity, holiness, righteousness, and spiritual eyesight. Jesus lets them know in verse 19 that God disciplines those he loves. Therefore, to avoid discipline, they should repent. They should renew their commitment to Christ and become an effective witness to non-believers. Church, Jesus loves us so much that he offers us grace in verse 20. He says, in spite of us being lukewarm, Jesus says, behold. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. I'm knocking on the heart this morning. I'm knocking on the door of your heart this morning. And he said, if you hear my voice, if you hear my voice, open the door. He said, and then when you open the door, I'll come in. I'll dine with you and you with me. Notice, Jesus didn't say he would open the door. Why? Because you see, on Jesus' side of the door, there is no door knob. The knob of the door is on your side. You're the one who has to open the door. You're the one who has to invite him in. Jesus invites them and he's inviting you and I this morning to renew our relationship with him. Church, if we are truthful with ourselves this morning, we can admit that many of us 
have been living a lukewarm Christian life. We've allowed the things of this culture, the things of this world to infiltrate our lives and pull us away from our first love. If we're honest, we have spent more time, energy, and resources pursuing the things of the world rather than pursuing a relationship with the lover of our soul. In closing, let me say this. This morning, Jesus is saying, all is not lost. I'm knocking. Do you hear him this morning? He's knocking on your door. He's knocking. He's saying, my brother, will you let me in? My sister, will you let me in? Will you repent and welcome me back into your life once again? Church, he knows all about us. He knows everything we ever said. <laughs> everything high sky and everything we've ever done. And still, he longs to have an intimate relationship with you and I. If we truly let him in this morning, church, and surrender our lives over to him afresh, we will have victory. We will have victory. If we're honest this morning, we have been like the Laodiceans and we have taken our relationship with Jesus for granted. But this morning, church, here's what he says. I don't want much from you, church. I just want to spend time with you. I just want to draw close to you just one more time. One more time, would you draw close to me? Draw me close. You don't have to play, that's a fine. Draw me close to you, never let me go. Draw me close to you. Never let me
got you all I want. I don't care about the riches of this world. If I got nothing else, if I can have you, you are all I want, God. You're all that I need. I hear you knocking this morning. And I'm going to open the door. I'm going to say, come on in. Come on in. Dine with me so that I can dine with you. To be in your presence is all I want. Nothing else matters because I come to realize no one else can take your place. Nobody else can love me like you love me. Nobody else will provide for me like you provide. You're all. You're all I need. Is that your prayer this morning? Even where you are right now in your seat, would you whisper to him and say, I'm opening the door. Come on in. I won't be tired of being lukewarm. I want to be a son or a daughter that's hot, on fire for the kingdom. Father, we thank you this morning for showing up in a mighty way. Thank you for how we were ministered by your word through song. Thank you. When all else has failed, there you are. Even in spite of God, when we are not following after you, still you're chasing after us. And then you said that the church hear what the Spirit is saying. And the Spirit is saying, come on. Come on, let's get reacquainted. Come on. Let's start a fire here at East Preston. Let's start a fire in my home. Let's start a fire in this the community that will cause the, the media to come running to find out what's going on. And then they'll, they'll see the fire of the Holy Spirit. God, we surrender ourselves to you this morning afresh. Set us on fire one more time, God. As we leave this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forever. And the people of God said, Amen, amen and amen. God bless you all.